continuing talk about uh, sports writing. Let's talk about Ring Lardner. Ring Lardner was a uh, writer who was most active in the 1920s, and his uh, fiction has survived where many writers from that era haven't because he had an extraordinary uh, knack for writing oblivious characters. Uh, characters who do not know how much they are revealing to the reader uh, about themselves. And he used this uh, talent to expose um, hypocrisy. Uh, he, he was he was very very good at telling a story in a way that would reveal to the reader but not to the characters what the characters um, real motivations and assumptions about the world were. Uh, in sports fiction he was a he was a sports writer when that was a fairly new um, pastime or fairly new job. Uh, it, it was primarily because of the the incredible rise of interest in in professional sports in the 1920s. This is when the Olympics, for example, became a, a, a tournament of worldwide interest. This is when radio made it possible for people to follow distant sporting events uh, in real time, or if not that, for them to get news of the outcomes of those events almost as soon as they happened. You know, they would be in the papers hours after uh, you know, minutes perhaps after they took place. Uh, the rise of film allowed people to see uh, sporting events in, in newsreels or uh, to see, you know, what we would now call highlights of, say, boxing matches, um, which took place far away very, very quickly. And so you were able to follow all of these stories um, very well. Uh, Lardner was a uh, baseball writer primarily. He had covered the 1919 World Series. He was one of the journalists who began to suspect that some of the games had been um, thrown by the uh, by the White Sox, who were the heavy favorites, uh, and which led to what was you know, now known as the Black Sox scandal. But he was also a fiction writer, and he used his uh, knowledge of the sporting milieu. Milieu? What a fun thing. Uh, he used the sport his knowledge of this world to write some some pretty great um, satirical uh, stories. Some of the best known are called You Know Me, Al, and they take the form of letters home um, from a, a traveling baseball star to his friend Al. And you know most of the stories sooner or later would uh, include the phrase You Know Me, Al, and that became the uh, the name for the stories as a whole. And these are stories about a guy, he's, he's kind of a sucker. He's not a bad player. Um, he's, he's a good, but he's a perennial um, believer of other people's BS. And so he lets himself get uh, into all sorts of scrapes and then thinks he's gotten out of them without ever actually coming to any deeper um, self-knowledge. So the message of the, the Ring Lardner stories in general is that people are too self-absorbed, unaware, um, unteachable to really, you know, ever, ever, ever get a better handle on themselves and ever make uh, a better, uh, a better shape out of their life. They just, they, they, they can't really do it. They're just kind of stuck. Jerks are jerks. Fools are fools. <laughs> and, um, this is a great, you know, m mechanism for comedy, and he brought it out extremely well. Comedy, of course, you know, according to Aristotle, shows people as worse than they really are, and that's that's kind of the Ring Lardner thing. People are, um, they're not evil, generally, although there are some heartless people in his stories. It's more just that they're foolish. Um, so in the You Know Me Al stories, this guy's the perennial rube, he's a good player off the farm, and he perennially gets taken in one way or another by the uh, the people that he meets without ever realizing that he's being taken and in fact thinking that he has a handle on the situation as he's describing these to his friend back home um, then the phrase you know me Al uh, becomes this kind of button where he commits to his 
accustomed manner of folly uh, rather than, you know, learn from his experiences. Uh, one of, another one of his, uh, of Ringlardner's fine baseball stories that you'll see in, you know, anthologies even today, especially of, say, comedic uh, fiction, is called Alibi Ike. Alibi Ike is a guy who joins a team and no matter what he does, he has to make an excuse for it. He has to give an alibi. Even when he does very well, um, he has to. It's like a, it's, it's a compulsion. So, you know, he'll go up and he'll make an amazing play or he'll get a great hit, and he comes back and the team will congratulate him, and he said, shoot, I should have done better except, you know, the sun got in my eyes. Or if I weren't battling this cough, he always has a reason and the team enjoys this about him. He, he again, he, not a bad person, a good player and, and a decent guy, but they just start to take advantage of this habit of his to see how far he'll go. This is also not just on the field. This is in regular life, and uh, you know they get into some they get into some hijinks. They play a prank on him that goes wrong, and it takes a while to to set it right. It's fundamentally a harmless story, just about this like human propensity that most people are sort of familiar with, even if they're not a chronic apologizer, is this, like, need to to brush off praise or blame um, with with some sort of excuse. So that that's kind of the Lardner style, is you take a, a real human quirk and extend it very far in the form of a character who, who just doesn't recognize how enslaved they are to this... Um, to this particular quirk, and then you let him bump up against people who uh, use it to, you know, have some fun. Uh, this isn't exactly, you know, I, I originally, I think I said something like Lardner was good at exposing hypocrisy, and, and he is, but it's not usually hypocrisy grounded in any, it's not like Moliere or, or, or classic satire. It's more just the hypocrisy of day-to-day -day presentation of self, just the way people present themselves to the world and what's actually um, behind it. Um, and it's, and it, you know, it's just fun. It's fun to see, it's fun to see, um, you know, people's real motives exposed in a generally um, safe comedic universe. Uh, one analog might be P.G. Wodehouse. Um, they're both, at their best, just masters of sort of this sort of stripped down comedic short story where a particular uh, human quirk leads to some hilarious results, but everything generally gets resolved safely, and the people involved are left with no better understanding of themselves than before. They are not introspective. These are not introspective people who can like look outside of themselves and see their behavior. They just kind of want things and go after them. And that's, you know, a fair description of a lot of people, and pretty much everybody at some time uh, finds themselves in this scrape of just, you know, I, what happened? This thing I wanted, and now I'm in all this hot water. What, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? But the people in both Wodehouse's and Lardner's stories um, are un, 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 pretty much incapable of looking back, autopsying what just happened, and adjusting their behavior in the future. Um, and you know, since that it that does describe a, a lot of us, sometimes even when we are able to sort of see what went wrong, we find ourselves we just can't make the necessary shifts in how we think and about things and how we act, and we wind up doing it again. And then we, you know, like so, it, it it it's nice to see it presented comedically. Um, the sports element is a good example. Um, maybe I'll talk about Wodehouse at some point because he also used sports. Um, to this end, primarily golf. The sports is a is a it in the in Ring Lardner's stories is secondary to the um, presentation of like the pleasures of the stories is not in his descriptions of sports. It's about you know sort of the mindset of the athletes and these comedic characters. But it is a good example of what has become really really standard uh, for. Um, you know, sports stuff for the last century, which is the sports provides a really convenient universe for the setting of fiction that you can assume your audience is aware of. Either people watching a movie or a show 
or in re uh, reading stories, you can assume that they know the basics of how the sports works, and thus becomes it comes a really convenient um, dramatic backdrop. You don't have to stop and explain things. You can assume that the audience will follow moments of drama because the sports provides an automatic setting where they understand the moments of drama. Like when someone walks up to the plate and there are two guys out and it's the ninth inning and their team is down, everyone knows that these events, how these characters respond, it matters. Or, you know, when, when you know, say Lardner wrote a, some boxing stories, so, you know, when the, the count is like six and somebody is struggling to get up, they understand um, that it's the boxer's response to this state of affairs that you know reveals their character. So with the sports, uh, the people's knowledge, the readership's knowledge of the sport serving as the backdrop, it really allows you to save a lot of time as a storyteller if you can simply set the dramatic beats of your story within this framework. Um, Wodehouse definitely did this with his golf stories, and Lardner uh, does it with baseball because as said previously in the uh, the shortstop, baseball was the sport. This is the era of Babe Ruth when everything about him was like reported. He became one of the first national athletic um, celebrities, certainly in a team sport. Uh, Jack Dempsey in boxing, uh, but you know, baseball was like, you could assume that when you said, oh he popped out to short, everyone understands you know, that the guy didn't do very well. Um, and this is very valuable. The assumptions that you can make about your readership's knowledge condition the kind of story that you can tell, how much you feel you have to explain, and this sort of thing. So, uh, we might say that Ring Lardner's um, baseball stories and his sports stories generally fall into the category of sports-based satire, but it, it's really more just kind of like the basic human comedy of caricature and, um, you know, people struggling with themselves and failing to develop, <laughs> um, which is, you know, a, a hallmark of comedy in so many different media, like the characters in, in Peanuts or the Marx Brothers. It's about failure to develop, um, or, you know, failure to draw the correct lessons and develop in the correct, um, way. And we just love these stories because it comforts us when we ourselves do it, and it makes us laugh when we see others struggle with stuff that we feel, you know, reasonably, um, solid on ourselves. It, 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 it gives us about a lot of schadenfreude and a feeling of, uh, kind of harmless superiority, uh, which is why comedy can be a, a tool of, um, you know, it can certainly be misused and, and built into harm, but it's also just a perennial delight, and uh, how it's used and how it's made will uh, continue to, to, to shift and change. And Lardner was one of the best practitioners of it and set it in this brand new world of, of, of mass popular professional sports. And because he sort of got there first and got there best, his stories have a kind of evergreen quality which once you can, you know, get past some of the, some of the, the dated slang and the, the lingo and just enjoy the beats, you can see all sorts of contemporary um, parallels uh, to, the, to the activities and the stories, and you can enjoy the idea that, you know, athletes have been struggling with these, these hangers-on and this, you know, uh, rude behavior from other teammates and the pranks and the taunting for, like, well over a century now, and that there's a certain uh, commonality um, between Lardner's time and ours. Uh, okay, uh, moving on. Next, we'll talk about uh, the sports stories of John Tunis.